All right, everyone. So we're going to be going over some more of programming assignment five today, and then I'll break a little bit early so you guys can fill out the course evaluations. Other than that, yeah, it's pretty much all about PA5 today. We extended the due date by 48 hours. You probably saw the email. It's Thank due at 11.55 p.m. Sunday night. Do get it in by then, please, and double check your submissions on Moodle as usual. It sucks to have to send me an email five days later saying you forgot to click the last upload button and I was losing 10 points on this assignment. So just double check it uh, before after you submit it. It takes an extra 30 seconds of your life and it'll save you some work later. Other than that, the last problem set, which will be your final assignment for this class, will be released Friday evening. It's due midnight a week from Friday, essentially. It's due 11.5 p.m. technically. Um, so you'll have that to work on next week. And you'll, I mean, it's a, it's a problem set. Hopefully it doesn't take too much of your time to be keeping up with the reading and the lectures. But do get through that. You can either turn in a hard copy to me next week uh, on Friday, or you can submit it online like normal. The only other business then is, so next week's our last recitation. We'll be using it to go over any questions on the problem set and to cover a little bit of review. Next Friday, I'm going to be scheduling two final review sessions uh, like we did before the midterm. I'll be publishing those this weekend. So there'll be two of them back to back, an hour each. You can come to one or both. They'll be sometime Friday afternoon like they were last time. Is the final cumulative or just covers midterm on? You should confirm this with Professor Hahn, but it's cumulative. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I, he told me he was not planning on providing last year's exam or a practice exam. Uh, your best source of study material is probably the graded midterm as well as all of the answers from the problem sets that have gone out thus far. Uh, we will release the answers for the last problem set late next Friday night, so you'll have the weekend to look through that, the answers from that final problem set before your test Monday afternoon, evening, sometime on Monday, right? Okay, so before your test, 4.30 on Monday. Any logistical comments, questions? Okay, so with that, I'll start taking questions that any of you may have on programming assignment five. If we get through those, there's a few uh, common issues that I'll go over. So does anyone have questions on programming assignment five? Those are only emailing me questions. No one wants to ask them in person. Or maybe I've just done that good a job of answering them. Uh, so with our X editor wrappers, uh, what value are we going to be returning in those functions? Because like I know there's a function called it's like set and get and all that, and then we're passing in all the information that we need to actually run those calls. But what's going to be our return value? Part two, do we have to do error checking within the X editor? And I mean, you should. Yeah, you should be doing error checking. Um, the only time, I mean, so it's your job to define some attribute that you're going to use to signal the fact that the file is encrypted, to write that attribute every time it is encrypted, and then to check that attribute before you decrypt the file, right? So it may be spec'd in the PDF. Take a look. Uh, I don't know if I spec'd the name of the attribute or not. I may have, just to make your systems cross compatible. OK. If it says in there, do it, because then you guys can open files from it someone else. I mean, you can make it cross compatible between various implementations. Um, but as far as checking the error codes, I mean, look at the man pages for those X attribute calls. They have normal returns and they have error returns. You'll need to ch check the error returns. Uh, in one case in particular, Git will throw an error if the attribute you're looking for doesn't exist. And that's an error you want to handle, right? Because there's, if the attribute doesn't exist, you treat it as an unencrypted file. So you need to check the error if it's equal, if the error code's equal to that error, that particular error. And this is actually, it's, this error is checked in the X attribute utility for look at today. It does this too. So just look at the example code in there. But you'll need to check for an error. If there is an error, you'll have to see if the error is that one error. If it is the one error, it's not really an error, right? You just assume it's not encrypted. But any other error, you should pass up. So in your fuse function, exit with an error, set error number to a negative number, and you can add a PR statement if you want to open to the debug output. So in the case of uh, an attribute that you just don't recognize, it's not, you know, not encrypted at the one. You just have to, you know, right, uh, yeah, I mean, you will only error. ever be setting and checking your attribute. Okay. There may be 400 other attributes in the file, yeah. and you may be using some really weird system that actually uses X attributes. But yeah, all you care about is your one little X attribute. Okay. 
And yeah, it definitely is spec in the PDF, because I remember writing it. Um, so use whatever says in the PDF. That's the only attribute you need to worry about. If you go to fetch that attribute, you get the does not exist there, you get the file is not encrypted. Yeah, if, if the attribute is there, you have to check if it's true or false. And obviously, if it's true, you treat it as encrypted. If it's false, you also treat it as unencrypted. I don't know why it would ever be false, but if someone down the line wrote a decrypting utility that is set back to false and decrypted it, then you at least you'll recognize that. All right? Um, for the fuse main function, that last part that said to null, are we needing to change that? Uh, you can, and you okay. may. Because I can't find anywhere of like what we're passing into the function. I know it says like keys or something. So there's that tutorial that's referenced at the end of the PDF that talks about using that. Um, that it, it shows you there's look in the references at the bottom of the PDF and I posted it in the discussion board too. But okay. uh, there's a nice tutorial online that does a good job of showing how to use the. It's designed for you to pass in basically a user defined struct that gives you access to special that gives you access to your own data inside the fuse function. Um, you don't technically have to use it. You could accomplish the same thing by using a global, but that's dirty, and using this is a much cleaner way of doing it. Is that just the, uh, the accuracy? It's, this is the, just the operation that you're doing in, in, the, uh, your, in your main. So, right, so I don't use it at all. It's not in any of my examples, but it's in that tutorial example. There's an example that's used. Yeah. Yeah, so there's that last argument that, I mean, it's you pass it basically a pointer to a, there's like a private data struct that Fuse just knows how to take. Oh, yes. And then there's a function you can call inside yeah. Fuse that'll hand you back a copy of that. So it's essentially a way for you to pass any of your own data through it. Okay. So the place you might find this handy is when you're grabbing user arguments, you're going to need to keep track of the passphrase the user entered, you're going to need to keep track of what directory they want to mirror. So those are two things that you might want to wrap in a struct and then use that private data to essentially pass into your fuse functions, and then your fuse functions, you can retrieve that data and use it as you see fit, right? But then are we also passing in the RC and the RB? Yes, but only you don't have access to those after you pass them in. Oh, really? Fuse just pulls, I mean, you have to do your own. So fuse does its argument parsing, but you need to do your argument parsing, right? Fuse doesn't know anything about a passphrase, and fuse doesn't know anything about mirroring directly. So you would need to take those off yourself, uh, and then basically you're going to need to rebuild argv and argc with the, your, the things you care about removed and pass the rest of the argv and argc to use, and it'll deal with everything else. It, it's your job to deal with anything you've added, which in this case will be the mirroring directory and the passwords. Okay. Uh, and then once you extract those, you're going to need a way to actually get into your program, which is where that private data comes in. <laughs> or use a global variable and lose some points on style, right? But there does exist a way to avoid using global variables that would be best to use. In that fuse main, I noticed we are pricing at RC. Is it does R so does R and V need to be null terminated before? Uh, so R V is never null terminated, right? R V is well it is an exact V, that's why. So R your R C needs to reflect it. So yeah. you're gonna probably be in the situation of needing to do something like this, right? So you're gonna pass to your function, whatever, I can't remember what we call it. You have your encrypt file system, right? And again, this calling convention is standardized in the PDF, so forgive me if I'm mixing it up, but I think you need to pass it a passphrase, so you would pass it a password or something, then you pass it your mirror directory, and then you pass it your amount point. So Fuse just wants this, right? These are your problem to deal with. So when you get argv, in this case, you're going to have argv, which is going to be an array of char stars, right? So your argv is going to be equal to encryptfs with a null terminator. Just assume these all have null terminators on them. Password, mirror, and So by default, with this, your argc is going to be equal to 4, right? So standard format. So Fuse wants this and this because if I mean I don't actually know if it needs the program name. There's you can do a clever hack if it doesn't. You can basically just truncate the array to this point and just change this to one and pass it on. But what you're going to need to do is essentially you'll need to take argv of one. So this is argv of one, right? You'll need to take that and save it somewhere where you can get to it later. You'll need to take argv of two. Save it somewhere later, 
But then you can't just pass argc and argv directly to fuse because it's going to look at this and think this is your mount point because that's what it does. It finds the first non-option argument and treats it as the mount point. So now you need to essentially, I mean, there's a couple ways to do this. Uh, the best way to do it would be to write a little loop that basically builds a new argv. So you're going to need to mount some memory, so on and so forth. But you basically loop through, you do a new argv that just, that basically just took argv of zero and so I'll call this new argv of zero. It says it's equal to the original argv of zero. Then you would skip argv of one and two, and you'd have new argv of one set equal to whatever argv, so this used to be argv of three. And then bear in mind there may be other flags here, because things like the debug flag and stuff, that is you to fuse. So you basically, anything past this point, you would just keep copying onto here. So you would then, you would just do this loop through argc, so on and so forth. And then you would need to make a new argc, which your new argc was essentially going to be your old argc minus two, right? Because you've just taken off these two. So Fuse is going to think that you're passing it exactly what you're passing the example. You're just going to strip off your specific things before that. If this doesn't matter, you don't even have to worry about malloking memory, you could test this theory. But if it doesn't actually care about the program name, if, if it does care about it, it uses it in debug statements. But you can do a hack where you just subtract two from argc, and then you basically just redefine the argv pointer such that argv of zero is pointing to here, because then argv of one will be your mount point. And if it ever goes and tries to find its program name, it's actually going to read your mirror path. But if it never actually looks for the program name, it, it doesn't matter. And that saves you the trouble of mounting. But the cleanest way to do it would be to, to malloc up some new memory. You use you basically have to go through and find the string length of each of these you call malloc on and so on and so forth. It would be to write a little loop that just built a brand new copy of RB and RC that just removed these two. But the hacky way is you assume that it doesn't care about this, you just shift the pointer to here, you subtract the appropriate value from here, and you go on your merry way. Okay. Are we gonna need to do um, uh, uh, a string copy then uh, into that new uh, well, if you were if you were building a new one, yeah, yeah you could. Yeah, yeah. So that's what you would do. Here, here, the strings box. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. You, well, you, so there's actually a string loop function that does it all. That's what I was thinking. You yeah. could just call. So I mean, it's really pretty easy. You write a for loop and call string. Right. Mean, there's a whole bunch of ways to do this. You would need to generate some new memory somewhere. Yeah, so you have to make sure then that you call. You'd have to add a free call yeah. for whatever you generated after the fuse new function. So fuse is going to run when fuse exits that whatever's after. Okay, you're you're you're, you're doing a return fuse main. If we malloc that, uh, so you would just call fuse main. You check the return, check the return value, and then call and free and then return. So we can't assume they're going to free that. Yeah, so you would yeah. just save okay. the return value. You would call your free and then you return value. I mean, little details. Right? Yeah. Um, there actually, fuse does have a way to make it aware of custom variables and to like let it handle this parsing for you. It's more complicated than this. So if you want to go down that path, great. It's under documented like many things in the open source universe, but uh, it does exist. If you want to read the source code for it, you have to figure out how to use it. Um, but this is probably easier, right? Okay? So argument passing. Other questions? Okay, how people think of them. I'm uh, explaining what I think you should know about. So the next thing we're going to look at, because uh, this question's come up from a couple of people, is how to use the fuse debug output. Um, because it's probably going to come in handy when you run into the inevitable errors that you will. So fuse runs as a background daemon, right? It's not a regular program that you started and it runs the collision and exits. It, it's running as long as your file system is mounted. So Fuse is running from the moment you call that mount executable to the moment you call unmount or shut down your system. Uh, it's just running in the background with no regular terminal. So when you call fprintf statements and stuff like that, there's nowhere for them to go. They're just going to get dropped, and there's no way to really monitor it. Hence the debug output. So the debug output essentially gives you a way to run a terminal that's just a streaming <coughs> copy. It basically associates a terminal with that daemon. So anything something gets printed from that daemon, it just shows up on the terminal. Now that terminal then just needs to be kept open for as long as you're using the file system. 
and you'll need to open up a separate window to actually do things and keep track of it, and so on and so forth. So quick demo, this is just the code exactly as you guys have it. There's nothing I've modified here. Uh, this is just the starting code, so I went ahead and compiled it. Uh, we're going to do our demo with Fuse XMP, so we used this once last week, we'll do it again today. So I'm going to start just by mounting it the normal way, so without the debug output. So I'm going to do, I, I have a directory called mount XMP. Uh, I think it's unmounted right now. Yeah. So if I do an ls on it, I get nothing, it's just an empty directory. So we're going to go ahead and mount the Fuse example, so I'm just going to call Fuse XMP, and then I'm just going to pass it the mount point. And now when we do ls on that mount point, we get the root directory. Again, this just mirrors the root directory. We'd expect these things to match. So this Fuse program is still running, right? It returned right away, but it's not because the program's not running. It's because the program's just been turned into a daemon where essentially it no longer is associated with the terminal. It's running in the background. If I look at my processes, so I look at all processes and I grep them for Fuse, we can see the Fuse daemon. So this is, this is what allows Fuse to talk to the kernel, and then this is the actual Fuse system that I just ran, right? So Fuse is clearly still running in the background, it's just that it's not in my terminal anymore. Um, so if I want to get around this, if I want to actually run it with the debug output such that it kind of stays running in this terminal and keeps generating output for me, that's what the debug flags for. So I'm going to unmount it as is. Again, you can use the Fuser mount utility, the dash U flag is for unmount, you just tell it what mount point and dash XMP doesn't do autocomplete. Uh, now, if we do that same PS, so the fuse demons that talks to the OS is still running, but my my, my file system is no longer running. Uh, so if I do an LS again, we can confirm that. Again, we're back to an empty directory that's not mounted there. So I'm going to mount it again, but this time I'm going to mount it with the debug flag set, which is a pretty simple flag. You just add a dash D here. There's actually a whole slew of options you can pass to Fuse. Most of them won't come into play for you. If you give it a dash H, it'll give you this big dump of all the options here. Um, again, this is also why it's important to make sure you pass through, once you take off your own arguments, you need to pass everything else. You can't just pass that one next one. Because as soon as I start passing things like dash H, Fuse needs to be getting these two because it's the one that knows how to deal with this. But if we look at the help, there's this dash D here. It's for debug, so we're going to go ahead and call it with the debug flag. Um, can everyone see this okay from the back? Does it need to be smaller, larger? Is it readable? Okay, cool. Uh, so we're going to call this again, only this time I'm going to pass it the dash D flag. Otherwise, the calling convention is exactly the same. When you guys get to doing this, you're going to need to make sure if you have your passphrase and your directory in here, the dash D flag needs to go after them, right? Because it's Fuse that knows how to handle it. Unless you want to code a bunch of your own magic to ignore that flag. But um, the easiest way to do it is it would just be your file name, your password, your mount directory, then that, or your near directory, dash D, then the mount point. Uh, you can actually flip the order of these. Fuse doesn't care what order it gets and stuff, but make sure the dash D comes after all of your things uh, if you don't want to deal with it yourself. So if we run this with dash D, now Fuse does an exit. A little blinky cursor down here, never return to a terminal prompt. We're still running. Um, a whole bunch of things just happened. A couple things to pull out of this. There's always this unique here. This is just a counter. It gets incremented by one every time something happens in Fuse. So this allows you to basically keep track of where, I mean, this output's hard to read, right? When something particular happens, this kind of gives you a clue as to where it's happening in the output. Other things you can see here, these opcodes refer to, essentially, these correspond to the functions that you're coding inside of Fuse. So it called the read address function. There's some stuff here you don't really need to worry about. This kind of refers to what it's calling it on but it'll give you the output here as success. So if you start seeing a bunch of errors, that probably means you're doing something wrong in here. Some errors are normal, like this one at the bottom. Fuse by default always tries to find this autorun.inf file. This is, Fuse runs on multiple operating systems. This is more of a Windows thing that would then go and auto-execute this. If it found it, you can't find it, it's throwing an error. There's no problem with that. But if it starts throwing errors on your functions, it's places to look. Now, it's not frozen. It's just waiting for something to happen, right? There's nothing going on right now. There's a bunch of stuff that happened at the beginning when it was mounting, but then there's nothing going on. 
So what I'm going to do is, I have a second terminal window open here, so I just have another tab open. Uh, I'm just going to go over to that tab, and let's take a look back over here real quick. So right now we're at 355, so just remember that number, right? It's, that's what we're going to, anything that happens after this is going to be a result of the command I'm about to run. So we come back over here, and I'm just going to run a basic LL, uh, ls command on that mount XMP directory. So I do that, it looks like it worked correctly. If we come back here, you'll note, well, now we're down to 392. So if we scroll back up to the output at 355, we can essentially, so everything after this point is what Fuse did in the course of running my ls command. So starting here at 356, the very first thing it did is it called get attributes on the root directory. That's the directory it's mirroring, right? It needs to start with a get attribute call because it needs to make sure I have read permissions. LS will return with an error if I don't have read permissions on the root directory. So it's calling that, it's doing a three permission check. I mean, most of these are wrappers like you've seen, so they're just calling the underlying system. But you can kind of see it reads the directory, then it opens the directory, then it reads the contents of the directory. It's doing lookups, so it's essentially opening my root directory. It's looking up every file in it. So ls is actually kind of a complex command, right? It has to open the directory. It has to find every file in the directory. It has to call the get attributes on every file in the directory because that's how it gets the timestamp and color codes and all of that other jazz. So there's actually quite a bit that goes on here from the moment we can scroll back down to the bottom. But uh, so 40 40-ish fuse operations later, we're at the end of the LS execution. Um, had there been any errors in my LS system, I mean, you can see it here, it's looking up every file in my root directory. Had there been any errors, I would get some error output here, and I could then go through it to kind of try to find hints as to what's going on. People clear on this? So this will also be where your output shows up. If you do a print to standard error, or print a standard out, it'll land somewhere in this output. So if you're adding your own debugging statements, this is the place to come and look for them. Um, we can demo that real quick. So I just did a control C. If you do a control C in the debug output, that effectively it kills fuse. So you're effectively unmounting it. Um, it's actually nicer just to call the unmount command. I'll do that next time. If you call the unmount command, you actually see all of the fuse exit commands running, and then this will just pop you back to normal. Uh, but I was lazy and just hit control C. My, my system is no longer mounted. If I do LS on this, I don't get anything, right? I'm gonna open up the source code for Fuse XMP and we're gonna add a few outputs just to demonstrate that. So the get attribute function is something that gets called a ton, so we'll just stick ours in there. Can you send like a signature, a sig hub to, to your term out for a close it clean link and it? On yeah, I, th I, I don't know how it responds. It catches those signals. I don't know if it's all behavior uh, You could try it. Uh, you can just, I mean, the best way to do it is just you, call the un you use the amount utility. Yeah. And it calls all the appropriate That's amount things. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so I'm just going to add some debug here. We'll do it in the read directory command because that clearly got called when I did ls. So I'm just going to come down here. I'm going to add a few f printf statements. on standard error or standard out. So just standard up print up statements, and standard error, standard out, no magic here. I'm going to save it. I'm going to rebuild it. And now we're going to run it again with that debug flag. So it's going to do its thing. It's down here to 354 this time. Let's run our ls command again. So again, it jumped down xlot commands. If I scroll up, we can see if we can find our output. So it was at 350 something. Nope, 355 again. So again, the first thing it called the read address function, it runs its read address function. I put my print statements inside that function, so I get my two print statements here, and then it goes about its merry way. So you can embed your own debugging output, which can sometimes be quite helpful if you need this in your, if you're trying to keep track of status or, or hunt down where a bug is, uh, to the debug output, and it'll work just fine. So people pay on how to use the debug output, what it does. The fact that it just hangs down here most of the time isn't a bad thing. It's just, unless you're actively doing something to the Fuse file system, there's nothing going on. It's just chilling. 
So we can, this time, instead of hitting control C, I'll do it the right way. I'll actually come back over here and I'll run the unmount command. So again, user mount dash U, I just give it the mount directory. It exits correctly. If I come back to here, we'll see this is all the stuff that gets called when fuse hits an unmount. When it gets done, it exits and I'm back to it. All right. What are we going to do for our training <coughs> sessions? Like, what are we? So I will have you come in and run a series. I will either write a script, which is why it's important for you to make sure you name things like, like it says in the document. But I will either write a script or I will just have you do a number of file operations that will basically involve confirming that your file system meets X functionality. So right? there will be a set of tests that test to make sure that the mirror directory is being written to. Then there will be a set of tests that test if encryption is working, test if decryption is working, test if the whole system is working. Um, that kind of stuff. It'll either be in a script or I'll sit there with the script and say run this command, run this command, do this, and so on and so forth. Okay? Other questions? And then obviously you'll need to be able to explain after we run through that, that'll get you to 40% of your grade. Then I'll have you actually open up your code and you'll need to talk to me about how you implement it. Anything else? Okay, so fuse debug output, so on and so forth. So the other things we're going to look at is kind of where we got interrupted last week. We don't have a ton of time left, but we got another 15 minutes where you need to fill out your reviews. So um, I want to look at the X attribute utility and the few script utility. So these utilities serve two purposes. One, you can use their source code as an example of how to use extended attributes and how to use the encryption. And two, you can use them in your debugging because they're little utilities that actually do useful things that will allow you to, I mean, you could use this utility to encrypt the file and then see if your file system can decrypt it, or vice versa, such that you can write parts of your file system at a time without having to implement everything. So let's look at the X attribute utility first, because that's probably something people are less familiar with. So X attributes stands for extended attributes. It's just a standardized POSIX system for assigning arbitrary metadata to files. So in Linux, you have the metadata that all files have by default, right? These are your timestamps, the creation date, the last modified date, you have your user permissions, you have the name of the file, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes we want to add extra metadata to files. So things like Dropbox use this system to keep track of whether or not a file has currently been synced with the Dropbox server or not. Um, you guys are going to use this to mark a file as either being encrypted or not. So the ETS attributes are actually implemented by the underlying file system. Um, and there's some things you have to do to make sure they're enabled on the underlying file system. It talks about it in the PDF and in the README. Just make sure you go to those steps. Not only do you need to have the dependencies installed, but you also need to make sure that when your computer boots, it's, it turns on extended attributes on the given partition. Um, I'm really not going to dwell on this because it does talk about it, but um, every computer or every Linux machine has an FS tab file that basically tells the machine which file systems need mounted. When, if you want to use extended attributes, you have to make sure that this user x attr flag is set on your home file system. So on this machine, I actually have two file systems that it's set on um, down here. And well, maybe it's not set on Android. Maybe it's just set on home. But I'm doing all my testing on my home file system. So I need to make sure this is at least where, wherever you're going to be doing your testing, whatever directory you're going to be using as your mirror directory, needs to be on a partition that has this flag set on that time. Again, this is talked about in the PDF. If you forget this, you're going to get errors. So you've been warned. Uh, if we look at what X attributes actually do, so I have this little X attribute utility. It talks about it all in the README, but it takes a number of flags to tell it what to do. The dash L flag is just going to list any attributes assigned to a file. We're going to point it at this copying file here. And if we run it, we get nothing. Because not that many things use X attributes, so it's pretty common for files to have no X attributes set at all. So we're going to go ahead and add an X attribute to this. So the dash S command does that. X attributes need two things. I need to give it a name for the attribute, and I need to give it a value. So I'm just going to call the name my attribute, and then I'm going to call the value my value. I run that. If I get no output, it means it worked correctly. Now if I go back and run the list command again, we'll see I get this one attribute on there. In Linux, X attributes have to obey certain namespace parameters, which is why this user doc got tapped in front of here. In particular, if you in that FS tab file, you may have noticed it said X attribute user. That's signaling to the system that my program should only be allowed to manipulate X attributes that start with the word user dot. If I try to 
I appended this automatically inside the utility, but if I didn't, this would throw an error. It would give me a permissions error. Um, you guys are going to have to deal with this too. So all of your attributes need to start with the five letters user dot. It just simply won't work if they do not. Um, so that's why it's appending that on there. I can also then read that attribute. So if I do a dash G, and then I need to give it the attribute name, it'll go ahead and read that attribute, tell you what the value of it is. Um, Again, all of these commands is doing it transparently. When I type my attribute, it's tacking a user dot in front of it before it does anything. And that's just obeying, I mean, that's just making sure it falls within this user namespace. Uh, there's kind of a logical reason for this. If we ever do get to the point where tons of programs are using X attributes, you don't want various programs overwriting each other's X attributes, right? So user dots for user space programs, that avoids overwriting X attributes used by the file system. If you look at the spec in your program, the correct way to do this is actually user dot then the name of your program dot, and then the name of the attribute for that program. So that way, if, if another program has an encrypted attribute or doesn't interfere with your encrypted attribute, you will be user dot TA5 encrypt or whatever I told you to do dot encrypted. So it's just good practice to assure you don't start breaking other people's code down the road because this is a shared namespace. <coughs> if I want to remove this attribute, there's another command for that. The dash R will do that. Now if I list again, I mean, copying. If I try to get an attribute that doesn't exist, I get this error that says the attribute doesn't exist. So we talked. This is what we went back to at the beginning, right? You need to make this is a special error that's handled differently from other errors. If it doesn't exist, I have a special case because that would normally just be treated as unencrypted. Um, if it does exist, then I would treat it as out of whatever value is. Okay. So if we look at the source code for this real quick. It's all in this x attribute util.c file. The bulk of this file is just parsing, basically parsing the command input, right? There's some things here that give the appropriate usages. Here's where I'm actually telling it that I want to, I mean, this is where I'm setting that user dot constant, right, to make sure I can win that. And then if we actually get down in the main, We'll see, we parse the input arguments, and then for each input argument, we do the appropriate action. So like we call list those system calls that correspond to pretty much everything I just did. So this list x attribute system call, there's a git, there's a set down here. So here's my set x attribute system call. So in your guys' file system, you'll be basically ripping out parse line, and you'll need to be calling these system calls, or write yourself a nice little library that calls these system calls. Um, but you will need to be using these. Questions on that? So how I did it in here should be a pretty good example of best practice. Um, so feel free to follow this, and uh, hopefully it'll ease using this attributes. There's also man pages for all of these. They'll only show up if you've installed the dependencies, but they're also on the internet, so if you just Google these are the man pages for them. Do read through those man pages. There's some cleverness that goes on here uh, with things like passing it a zero. It tells me how big the attribute is, so I can then allocate a program on a space for it, and I call it a second time and actually grab it. So there's some clever memory management stuff going on here that I want to account for right now. All right? <coughs> cool. So the other thing we're going to look at is the encryption utility, which serves the same function. It's basically a little utility that gives you the ability to encrypt and decrypt and shows you how to use, essentially, my little library functions within library functions is actually calling the open SSL functions. Just like you can use this to troubleshoot, I mean, if you want to make sure your encryption flag is getting set correctly, call this with the dash L on one of the files in your file system, right? There's extended attributes are exposed to everything. So if you're setting them correctly, you should be able to read them with this utility. Uh, you can also manually set them with that utility. If you've only implemented the code that checks them, but you haven't implemented the code that sets them, just go and manually set a bunch of files with the right flag and make sure it's working. So these should aid iterative development. Uh, this can do the same thing. If you're using my library functions to encrypt and decrypt, then you can also use this to encrypt and decrypt your files. Uh, so if we just look at it, it kind of works the same way. This is all in the readme again, but if I give it a dash E flag that's telling it I want to encrypt a file, I need to give it a passphrase. And then I need to give it the name of the input file. So I'll just encrypt that, give a new license essentially, give it a name of an output file, and I'll call my output file lowercase copying with a dot E because it's encrypted. So I run that, it completes correctly. We do a, we cap that output. We get what we would expect, a whole bunch of non-human readable encrypted binary gibberish. Um, 
We go back to here and we run this again, but this time I'm going to decrypt it. So I'm going to get the dash D5. I got to make sure I give it the same password. It'll be an error if I don't. This time my input file is the output file from the previous operation, so I'm encrypted file. And I'm going to call this copying.d for decrypted. And now if I cap that, we should be back to where we started, right? Certainly looks like we are. We can confirm that by diffing these against each other. So I'm going to diff my original copying file, which is what I started with, with the file that I ended with. And I get no differences. If your system is working correctly, you should be able to essentially do this test, right? You should be able to copy something to your encrypted file system, copy it back out of your encrypted file system, diff it against the original, and make sure there's no differences. Because if you're doing it right, encryption should be a, a completely reversible operation. Um, this also has a, a third mode. Um, in addition to encrypt and decrypt, it has essentially an identity mode that just copies the input to the output without doing anything to it at all. Uh, this may come in handy in the case where the reason this mode exists is because sometimes you have to do this. Namely, if your file system grabs an unencrypted file, you want to put it into this mode, right? So this gives you a nice way to basically call the same function every time and just change what the mode is to determine whether you want to encrypt, decrypt, or not do anything at all, but not have to write an entire special case for that. So if I do this, I just need to give it an input file. We'll give it copying again, give it an output file, copying.c, and I can do that same diff I did a minute ago. And again, there's no differences. It just made a perfect copy of the input file. No encryption, I mean, no magic at all. So it's like just a copy. If we look at the source code, um, so, yeah, thanks. Like the other one, the bulk of this source code is overhead. It's dealing with making sure the user is giving you the appropriate inputs. It's setting up the appropriate files. The interesting line is right here, right? This is where it actually calls that crypto library function. It passes it the input and output file that it opened up up above. It passes it in action. This is what corresponds to whether it's decrypting, copying, or encrypting, right? Uh, these are defined probably at the top of that library function, but uh, a negative one is makes it copy. I think a zero makes it decrypt, and a one makes it encrypt. Look at the file. Uh, the source file will tell you. Um, but again, this allows me. I basically have one line of code that handles all three cases. All that changes is I just change the action in each case. Um, just a little optimization. And then I pass it my password, essentially, or, or what it builds its encryption cipher. So uh, you're welcome to use this function directly. You're also welcome to dive into the source code for this function, look at the SSL functions that it's calling, and use those directly. Um, you are required to use, to, don't go writing your own encryption, right? Either use my library function or use the library functions underneath my library function. The number one rule of using encryption in your programs is never write your own encryption. It's just a bad idea. Uh, you won't do it correctly. It won't be well tested, and it'll probably be wrong. Because writing good encryption is really hard to do. And there's a small number of people that are alive in the world that can actually do it correctly. So leave the encryption writing to them. You just use it in your libraries. Um, OpenSSL is pretty state of the art. It's been well tested. It's open source, which ensures that we can review the code and make sure there aren't any obvious errors. Uh, it's probably not going to be broken anytime soon, or at least not for stupid reasons. Your home world encryption is probably going to be broken tomorrow because you forgot some silly edge case that makes it ridiculously easy to crack, right? And at the end of the day, no encryption is better than bad encryption because bad encryption just convinces people that they're safe when in fact they aren't. So if you're going to use encryption, use real encryption. Never roll your own until you get a TPHD in the subject and are, are working for a team that knows how to do it. This friendly public service announcement brought to you guys. <laughs> All right. So, questions on this. It came up briefly in the last class. This takes file pointers. A lot of the functions you're going to be dealing with in your fuse need file descriptors. There are functions, there are C library functions that will translate between a file descriptor and a file pointer. Uh, you can Google for them or email me and I, I'll send you what they are, those man pages for them. Uh, but essentially, if you want to use this as is, you're probably going to find yourself needing to open a file pointer based upon a specific file descriptor. There are functions that will do that for you. 
or you could go into here and write a second version of this that uses file descriptors instead of file pointers, right? I mean, do whatever you want. Just understand file pointers are what the C library IO uses. All the F star functions use file pointers. All of the lower level functions, open, close, read, write, that don't have enough from them use file descriptors. You need to translate between the two. Uh, just a real quick question. Uh, I was digging around inside DoCrypt and um, looking up the man pages on the OpenSSL calls. And it says that it has a pass through, but you skipped it. And I pulled out your pass through code, and the pass through didn't work with the OpenSSL. Is that actually a bug, or was I just doing it wrong? I don't know. I'd have to have you show me. You mean there's a pass through? I mean, so I'm the using the OpenSSL. Oh, wait, the OpenSSL has its own identity has pass through, own pass through but it did yes. not work. I never. Yes. Uh, so I think he's talking about an AES script .c, right, in the yeah, library. Yeah, yeah, in the, yeah. the actual um, OpenSSL library. I didn't know that it had its own pass-through, and I've never tried to use it. Okay. So I have no idea. Sorry. Uh, it probably isn't a bug, but who knows? It's also really poorly documented, right? So right. it's hard to know whether or not you're using it correctly unless you can find an example of someone else that has said this should work. Okay, thanks. Um, for Emacs, when it's opening a file, let's just say that you implement it so that um, you decrypt a file that you already know is encrypted because of an attribute. You decrypt it, create a temporary file, rename it so that it's the original so that Emacs doesn't get confused and you open it. And then let's just say that you want to edit the file and resave it. Um, could you talk about how Emacs uses those two functions, the read and the write, I guess in, in sequence? Um, Kind of get an idea. I mean, you really shouldn't have to worry about exactly how Emacs is using it, right? Because right. your system should be generic, right? right? If you're using a temporary file that's stored somewhere on disk, you need to be making sure that from the moment open is called to the moment close is called, all calls need to be pointing at that temporary file, right? Or else you're going to get weird size mismatches. Because so you shouldn't be doing any renaming or anything until the very end. So uh, all, all the work I wouldn't, so I mean, it, there's, there's multiple ways to do this, right? But one argument says when they call open, you should decrypt the file and create a temporary file. Right. All calls after that point until they call destroy or release or whatever corresponds to calling close should essentially point to the temporary file. Right. When they call close, you can look at the fuse command. There's actually no close fuse command, but there's some that it corresponds to. Whatever the last fuse command that's guaranteed to get called is, you should re-encrypt your plain text file, overwriting the old file, uh, and then essentially delete the plain text file. But in the center, all references should probably point to the temporary file. Now, the other way to do this is to not maintain state, and to just say on oh, I mean, it's far less efficient, right? But you could also, right now, just like on every read and write, it opens the file, reads it, and then closes the file. You could open the file, decrypt the file, read it, encrypt the file, and then close the file. So you can do the same thing on the micro scale, which makes it a little bit easier, because then you don't have to worry about things. I mean, it's, it's all contained within the read and write, so there are no other functions that have to worry about it, right? The other functions can just point at the encrypted file, because they're never, it's never open, right? You're never going to have this dichotomy of pointing at one file but using another file. Um, so I tried to use, uh, I tried to do it the way, the, the original way that you were just talking about, where you create, a temp, you, you decrypt the file, and in, in, in essence, you're creating a temporary file where all the reads and writes are happening on plain text. I did that in Emacs, keeps giving me an error saying the file doesn't exist. The file that, that it wants to I, I would fire up the debug output and start looking at it. It will work if you've done it correctly. So the fact that you're getting a file doesn't exist probably means that you're not redirecting something that you should be redirecting. Uh, if you have to figure it out, shoot me an email. Are you doing that? Um, it, I mean, just you really do have to make sure every function in there kind of takes into account your temp file, just like every function needs to take into account your near file. Um, so on and so forth. Okay, guys, uh, I'm going to leave you here to take care of the. To take